Rail, um, uh, rail is a, a sector which probably gives you a history but is up to 100 years ahead of where uh, vehicles are now going, electric vehicles. Um, and we can touch on a little bit about I was going to show you some, um, uh, some fairly geeky videos, but we've had a bit of an IT issue, so instead I'm going to give you some, uh, some historical perspective. So, back in 1837, 180 years ago, Robert Davidson was a chemist who, uh, much like yourself, had a bright idea. And he invented the world's first electric locomotive. And this was a time when there wasn't a, uh, really an alternative to horses uh, or human power. And he hauled a, uh, a train for a kilometre and a half up in Scotland. He was a bit ahead of his time. Um, the battery technology he was using on board wasn't really up to the challenges. And the staff who maintained the steam locomotives weren't too keen at seeing electrification take away their jobs. And they actually destroyed this, uh, this train and cast it into many pieces. And it took until the um, uh, 1880s, really, for Werner von Siemens to introduce the first uh, commercial electric uh, passenger carrying train. And it really took off from there. Across Europe, you saw electrification happening on rail, and it's continued to the present day. Interestingly, in 1847, um, George Stevenson, who you might associate with steam locomotives, um, came up with a uh, stunning quote which I'm going to share. I have the credit of being the inventor of a locomotive, and it's true that I've done a little to improve the action of steam for that purpose. But I tell you, young man, I shall not live to see it, but you may, when electricity will be the great motive power of the world. And I think we're now at the tipping point in road and the rest of uh, our energy systems where that statement is becoming true. So there you go, a little bit of history rather than some uh, geeky videos. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about rail, um, a little bit about the drivers of electrification in rail, and you'll see parallels with, um, uh, with some of the other sectors, but it's really important we understand what is the business requirement. Because we have great technologies, we've got to direct them towards what the customer is asking for. Um, a little bit about rail electrification itself. Touch on some of the challenges that rail has. There's many, but uh, we have short time. And I want to touch very briefly on what role energy storage can play. Because to be honest, I'm not here to preach you. We're engaging with people like uh, Dan Gladwin at uh, Sheffield University. Are you here, by the way? Dan, no, he's not here. Uh, at Sheffield University, really looking for the, uh, the next generation of ideas and solutions. So, a little bit about rail. It's quite big. Um, broadly, 8% of the overall uh, travel market in the entirety of the UK, if you exclude walking. And for uh, major cities, it is the bit which makes their economies work. Without rail, the uh, city would grind to a halt. As an industry in the UK, just na uh, national rail, um, we're talking about £9.3 billion pounds of passenger revenue a year and about another £5 billion pounds of government investment. So broadly a £15 billion pound a year industry. And this is what's happening. So from 1950, which was the previous post-war peak, we had roughly a billion passenger journeys a year. Um, since really the late 1990s, we've seen an unstopping increase in that. And we're now carrying, last count, 1.7 billion passengers a year on the net national network, similar number on London Underground, and that growth rate is not slowing. However, we're doing that on a network just half the size that it was in 1950. I mean, some of you commuting to London may uh, feel the effects of that. And that's one of our major challenges. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, a couple of years old, but 34% uh, uh, of route kilometres electrified. Obviously it's been most intensively used and that proportion is going up. As a network, a bit hard to see there, but you've got everything north of London, with the exception of a, a few oddities, is electrified at 25 kilovolts AC. <coughs> Everything south, with the exception of a few oddities, is electrified at a mixture of 600 to 750 volts DC. And there are a few odd urban rail networks, which are the other voltages of DC. A 
about 16,000 kilometres of electrified lines today, not counting London Underground. Um, that's similar in scale to National Grid. It's not quite as, uh, as big, but it's quite close um, to the National Grid itself. Okay. Um, so why electrify? First and foremost, it's about delivering something better and cheaper um, than the alternatives. So an engineer I've uh, put forward is somebody who can do for a shilling what any fool can do for a pound. And we've already heard lots of competing technologies for different applications. It's all about finding the right match of technology and solution to deliver something which is better and cheaper, goes further, faster and cheaper than what we have today. Why are electric trains better for this? Well, first of all, you're not carrying around the space requirement for the fuel and the motive power. Um, so diesel engines take up quite a large amount of space on a train. Electric trains have more space available for passengers. And when you're on a network where your train length is limited by the platforms, the more space you can put people in, um, the fewer people have to uh, stand like this. Um, one of the other main reasons is uh, where you need very high power. You need high power for two reasons. All high-speed rail is electrified because you simply cannot get an economic diesel um, solution to deliver the types of power we're talking about. We're talking 15 to 20 megawatts um, with quite high continuous ratings as well because the aerodynamic uh, losses require continuous high power at those speeds. But that power also allows you to unlock more capacity for trains. The limit to how many trains you can get through a section of track, most of our network is two track, is about how quickly can you get that stopping train away from the station and clear that track for the next train to come in. If you look at London Underground, they are experts at this. They're getting to 30 plus trains an hour through uh, platforms. That is an incredible throughput of people. Electric trains give you typically twice the power to weight ratio of a diesel equivalent. And that allows you to clear signal sections faster and get the next train intersection faster. And that can be the difference between operating 16 and 24 trains an hour, which is a 50% difference for these people stood in that carriage. Um, environmental, there's all the carbon dioxide impact and also the local pollutant impact. Um, diversity of energy supply and security of energy supply. We go through cycles over decades of energy costs rising and falling. We have geopolitical issues with sourcing our energy from abroad. Electrification allows us to use a wide range of energy sources. And money. It's about a cheaper overall solution. I could spend too much time talking about that, I'm not going to, but I'll just give you one example. If you're carrying around your fuel and a diesel engine and the emissions control equipment and your motor on a train, you are looking at an axle load of perhaps 17, 18 tonnes uh, per wheel set or on a locomotive up to 22 and a half tonnes. If you are carrying an electric train, that can be as low as 12 and a half tonnes per, uh, per wheel. And when you're moving steel on steel, at 125 miles an hour, the forces which are transmitted into the rail and into the vehicle um, are to do with accelerating the train. If your train is half the weight, you do half the damage to the train, but also half the damage to the rail. And when you're trying to run a 24-hour railway, keep it open with minimum uh, maintenance of the track. <coughs> Actually, the lighter weight of your train, faster it accelerates, but also the more you drive down infrastructure costs. There will be some geeky videos, but I've saved you from them. So, uh, AC electrification. This is typical. Um, a supply taken from the uh, National Grid or Distribution Network Operator every 30 to 50 kilometres, typically. The eagle eye amongst you will notice there's only two droppers coming down from the three phases of the National Grid. And that's one of the uh, constraints we have with rail electrification. Because you've physically got to uh, put a current collector in contact with a wire at very high speed, it's not feasible to get three phase power to the train. So we are a single phase network, whether it's DC or it's AC, we have a phase conductor 
and a neutral, which is typically the rays. Okay. Um, that would have been a beautiful mercury arc rectifier. It's not. Uh, the DC network is taken from three phases. We don't have the problem of negative phase sequence to deal with, but we have a different problem. We then have, because of a low voltage for DC system, high energy losses and quick loss of voltage along the line of route. The low voltage system, very high currents, typically up to 7,800 amps per train. That means short distances between substations. It's not economic to connect to the national grid every three to five kilometres. So we then have to run our own medium voltage free phase uh, system to supply power to these individual substations. Um, and this is a, a typical major feeding diagram. You'll see there are uh, two supply points here, each of which two transformers. Each of those transformers sits on different phase pairs. So in principle, they should balance the unbalanced effect of taking current from just two conductors at each individual transformer, in principle. In between, you have neutral sections, those black rectangles, which separate the different feeding areas of the railway. Just in terms of um, scale, you're talking roughly 10 to 15 kilometres between each substation. Typical supplies, you're talking taking 10 MVA up to 80 MVA, the biggest supplies, at each of these supply points. Okay. Um, just to add a bit more uh, scale to this, and it, it starts to inform your thinking about where does energy storage possibly fit in, the, in this world. Um, network rail, <coughs> rough annual energy demand for traction, about 3.2 terawatts, terawatt hours, sorry, um, per year. London Underground, off the order of 900 gigawatt hours per year. It's colossal energy demand, it's more than 1% total energy demand in the UK. And it's going to rise because the demand, the number of people wanting to take the train is rising year on year. We're electrifying more of the network, we're running longer trains. That straight away should get your mental cogs uh, thinking. I've lost count of the number of people who've come to me with smart grid solutions for how we'll charge up batteries at night and power the trains during the day. We're talking about each a single train is 7 megawatts. The scale should start to uh, uh, affect thinking about where energy storage fits in this mix. A um, couple of other um, little things, little nuggets to, uh, to keep thinking. Um, the asset life is different to working a vehicle. So a typical vehicle, I'll probably upset my automotive colleagues, but designed for its first owner, 80,000 kilometres before it starts breaking down. Um, <coughs> Pendolino today will be operating 500,000 kilometres a year. It will cover the lifespan of an electric car in its first two months of its life. It has an asset life of 40 years. During its life, it will go to the equivalent. We all know tabloids have units. The units are important to us as scientists. The standard units of length are, for example, double-decker bus. Um, in this case, uh, 25 times to the moon and back for that vehicle. And the shock loadings in the rail environment are enormous. Rail is a brilliantly efficient mode of transport because uh, at typical speeds, until you get to very high speeds, Energy losses in the car are dominated by the deformation of the rubber wheels. So it's friction with the road and, and so on, and you lose heat there. Steel wheel on steel rail doesn't do that. So it's staggeringly energy efficient. We have a circular test track, and if you set a train going at the start of that test track, it will still be going when you come back to it. It's absolutely incredible. Um, you can virtually coast from, uh, uh, from sort of wood green into Kings Cross Station. It's amazing. Um, okay. Uh, last one, shock loading is completely different. Um, the vehicle itself is nice and comfortable because you sit on an air suspension on top of bogies which are in physical contact with rail. A lot of our motor equipment is on those bogies. We try and minimise it so that uh, unsprung mass. That takes you to uh, a challenge of shock loading. So you could be looking at hundreds of Gs. Okay, challenges. Cost, clearances, getting wires through some of our historic areas. Voltage, you'll see because we have separate feeding areas, you see voltages towards midpoints 
drop off. And that is a design constraint because you're feeding from one point right to the end of the section where you then have a complete insulating section. Negative phase sequence because we are an unbalanced load. Getting heat out of tunnels. So for London Underground, big challenge for them. Every time a train breaks, if there's no other train in section to export their electrical power to, that will be lost as heat. And the load is very peaky. You're looking at four different supply points there. Both <coughs> loads do not line up. So the negative phase sequence doesn't balance out the adjacent sites. Also, your thermal rating, any more out of the existing system, is all about RMS, so specifically 30 minute time constant. The RMS load is much higher than the average. Now you start to see where energy storage possibly fits in. What can you do to avoid those wires through that tunnel? What can you do to take out some of that peaks and just smooth that curve? <laughs>